Today, we're going to continue in the book of James' study, and I want to begin to speak on how to resolve conflict, how to resolve conflict. So if you have your Bibles, go to the book of James, and we're going to be in the last verses of chapter 3, but I'm going to begin with the first verses. Amen. What a witness. I love that. Ah, You know, out of the mouth of a babe. Uh, We're going to begin with chapter 4, because when the letter was written, James' is the first letter to be written in the New Testament. They didn't have chapters and verses. So for us to fully understand the end of James 3, we have to maybe begin to be aware of what he says in the beginning words of James chapter 4. So, and if you don't have a traditional Bible, you could go to your Bible app right now. Let's do that. Go to your Bible app because we want to receive the engrafted word of God wide that it would save our own soul. And so I want you to know James is a letter on how to live when we have faith in Jesus. It's not a book that tells you how to have faith in Jesus, but how to live when you do have faith in Jesus. Now, what's amazing, in this letter, there are 12 speeches, and these speeches tell the believer how to become more like Jesus Christ. And every subject is 12 of them that he addresses. It's more information consecutively in these words than any other place in Scripture. And so today, Today, he is going to begin to deal with conflict. Now, let me just say there are three ways to deal with conflict. Number one, you ignore conflict. You just don't, when conflict arises, you hate it. So you're like an ostrich that puts your head in the sand. And that is not a godly way to handle conflict. You may think you're keeping peace, but it's an artificial peace. Now, others, now I could tell you right now, I am not an ostrich. I am a bull in a child. China cabinet, when conflict comes, I'm going to break every piece of China in that cabinet. Are you with me? And so some people overreact in conflict, but James tells us how to react, not react, but respond in a godly manner. Now, I want to say that these words in James chapter 3, in the beginning of chapter 4, are more timely right now than they were 2,000 years ago when James penned these words. I mean, just turn on the television and to see the conflict that is going on in our world. And I don't want to live always reacting to conflict. I want to respond in a godly manner, not a secular or a worldly manner. And James begins to speak about a wisdom, and you may want to write this down or chat it if you're online, a wisdom that is from above or from heaven, or a wisdom that is earthly, or a wisdom that is from beneath. So above or beneath, I want to respond with the wisdom that is from above. Now, if you're saying, I just don't think there's that much conflict. Listen, my two grandchildren, Jack and Lucy, they get up at seven in the morning while their parents sleep to the crack of noon. And and I was trying to meditate on scripture. Jack comes up. He says, Jude, put on Spider-Man. Lucy goes, no, Frozen, Spider-Man, Frozen, Spider-Man. Thus, conflict starts at a very early age. I want to know how to resolve conflict from above, not beneath. Are you with me? And so I want you to just uh, put this in our thinking today. Now, remember, the way the letter starts, he says, James, a bondservant of of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He does not say, James, the half-brother of Jesus, which I would have done that. Now, him being a half-brother of Jesus Christ, he would see that he would witness firsthand the conflict that Jesus experienced and how he overcame it. We're going to end on that thought, but I want you to know, no matter what you're facing right now, none of us have ever gone to the cross and resisted to the shedding of blood, and Jesus responded from wisdom that was from above, not wisdom of the earth. Amen. So let's begin to read in James chapter 4. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. Then we're going to go to James chapter 3 verses 18, 13 to 18. So here it goes. It says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from the desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust, or it says you desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot 
obtain. You fight in war. I want you to underline that or pay attention to that. If you're a note taker, write that down. You fight in war. I'm going to say it again. You fight in war. I'm going to say it again. You fight in war. Yet you do not have. And why do they not have? Because you do not ask. Verse 3. You ask, but you do not receive. Why? Because you ask amiss. Why? That you may spend it on your own or your pleasures. Now let's just stop. When it says you fight in war, in the Greek, the intensity of these words would be like two enemy nations coming to war and bloodshed would begin to happen. And they would begin to throw spears. Now that is the picture in the Greek. And it comes from tribalism. And in uh, parts of the world back then, when there was a tribe would go in and if they would spear, they're trying to spear their greatest warrior. And the, then what they would do, the other tribe would secretly go into the other tribe and they would spear a warrior. And it went on and on. Then they'd go back and the other tribe would spear a warrior. Can I tell you today, we're living in that day where there's conservative, there's liberal. Should you wear a mask? Should you not wear a mask? I don't want to live and throw spears. I want to be a guy that doesn't throw a spear, but I want to yield to the knowledge and the wisdom of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Now, I, I want you to write this down. I really want you to think, and we're getting ready to go to chapter 3. The reason why you and I need to learn to resolve conflict isn't just because it's wrong. It is because when I or you do not resolve conflict, it hinders us from receiving from God. When we do not resolve conflict because we want to artificially keep peace, it stops or hinders you and I, us, from receiving from God. Now let's go to James chapter 3. But before we do, I want to begin to define what a conflict is. Conflict is a fight. How many of you ever had a a fight. Okay, I'm looking, scanning the room. I'm trying to look online. Uh, people say, Pastor Jude, do you and Pastor Becky ever fight? I said, only once a week. It starts on Monday and it ends on Friday. Amen. <laughs> no, get this one. It, it, get this. A conflict is a fight. You may want to write this down. A battle or a struggle. Get this. Involving strife and discord. So it's not just a disagreement. But it involves strife and discord. I want to read a little bit more. Conflict happens, and James is saying that. Conflict happens whether it's emotionally, physically, or mentally. Conflict happens. Conflict usually invites others to take sides. Did you hear what I just said? When we have a conflict, it's usually inviting someone to our side. Is not America right there, right now. You go to Starbucks, you have someone come in with a buy and Harris t-shirt, then all of a sudden someone comes in with a mega hat and I'm telling you right now, you feel spears flying in the Starbucks. It is a strife that's destroying our nation, our families, our churches. And James is saying, we should not live that way. There is a wisdom from above where we could respond to conflict. Amen. Now, I want to begin to read, the, I love these verses, chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Now, going back, the reason we read chapter 4, because he's saying there's fighting, there's wars, there's conflict. Why? Because you have desires within. You don't have because you don't ask. But even when you do pray, you ask amiss. That means your prayer is coming. Amiss means we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And you do not receive because you do not ask and you want to spend it on your own pleasures. Now, let's begin to read in verse 13. Who is wise in understanding among you? I love that. Who is wise in understanding among you? And not only during this pandemic, I wanted to surround myself with people that were not only wise, but they were understanding. Now, when you begin to hear those two words, it's not new or foreign or the first time it's in the Bible. When you begin to read the letter of Proverbs or the book of Proverbs, which was written by the King, uh, King Solomon, the son of David, King of Israel, it says wisdom, discretion, and understanding is all throughout that book. So 
he says here, that who is wise in understanding among you, let him show it by his good conduct that his works are done. Please get this. I love this phrase. I've been meditating on this phrase. In the meekness of wisdom. I want to say it again. I want you to feel that. That is better than a chai tea right there. In the meekness of wisdom. Will you say that with me? In the I want you to say it again. Now get this. It says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast, which is a military term, that you're working yourself and lie against the truth. Look at verse 15. This wisdom, and this is where we're telling you two ways people handle conflict. Either one is from above or one is from beneath, or one is of the earth and one is heaven. It says this wisdom does not descend from above, but get these three things, but is earthly, sensual and demonic you need to circle that that is crazy that he puts those layers that wisdom that comes from the earth and we've seen it in riots and confusion is number one it's earthy and it's sensual and it is demonic let's read on this wisdom does not descend from above it is say it with me it is earthy it is sensual and it is demonic okay verse 16 for where envy and self-seeking exist confusion in everything is there i always know when i'm confused i'm operating in a wisdom that's from the earth and not a wisdom that is from above. Let's go to the next one. Verse 17, but the wisdom, let's say it, but the, say it again. But the wisdom that is from above, he gives five words. I'm going to do it in the NIV because that's what I initially memorized this years ago. I'm going to go back to the King James. It is pure. It is peaceable. It is easy to be entreated. New King James says it's gentle. It is gentle. I mean, I just got to stop right there. Sometimes you and I could be saying the right thing, but the tone in the way we're saying is the wrong thing. And it takes words that could be from heaven and brings them and makes them the tone of the earth. How many of you ever been beat up by a believer with verses? Are you understanding? So let's just say it says wisdom that is pure, it is peaceable, it's gentle or easy to be entreated without partiality and without hypocrisy. I want to say it from the New King James, pure, then peaceable, uh, gentle, willing to yield. Say that with me, willing to yield. Look at verse 18. I love this. Now, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I just want to begin to tell you and define what that word wisdom is. Now, in the Old Testament, the main word for wisdom is used over 300 times. So wisdom is very important to God. And please understand this. I love what it says. By wisdom, God created the heavens and the earth. So all the galaxies, the stars and the planet, God didn't do that by faith. He did that by wisdom. Now, wisdom is not just knowledge. Uh, My boys and a lot of young millennial leaders and a lot of younger leaders than millennial, they love listening to audio books. And they listen to book after book after book. Can I tell you right now, that's great, but knowledge is not wisdom. I'm going to say that again knowledge is not wisdom. I'm going to say that again. Knowledge is not wisdom. You could go on YouTube, learn how to make a barbecue pit, how to skateboard, how to paint your house, but knowledge, wisdom is not knowledge. Wisdom is knowledge applied to one's life. Now, another picture of, my, uh, of wisdom is this. Wisdom is living with skilled application. What is it that we hear the greatest sermons from the greatest Bible communicators? Come on, everybody today, you could listen to a sermon online. You could podcast. You could YouTube it. They have the content creators and the biblical communicators. What is it if we hear all the sermons, but we never live the sermon that we heard? Then we are not living in wisdom. It's not how many sermons you hear or how many verses you read or I read. It's how many of them I apply to my life. 
Okay, I'm going to date myself, all right? When I was first became a Christian, uh, you're not going to believe this. We did not have iPhones. We did not have CD players. We were just moving from eight-track uh, tapes to cassette tapes, and that was a major thing. But one of the ways, if you wanted to listen to a Bible teacher or preacher, you had to go and find a Christian radio station. And in the 80s, before most of you were even conceived, I, one of my favorite Bible teachers was Insight for Living, Chuck Swindoll, 4444, Fullerton, California, 930 something. I almost have the zip code. I heard him so many times. And this is what they would say. This is what they would say. They'd take a little commercial break and they'd go, now, back to the teacher. You know what made Chuck Swindoll so popular and how, why so many of us began to listen to him? Because most pastors, content creators, preachers, communicators, they would give 90 to 80 to 90 percent biblical information in only 5 to 10 percent application. It was opposite with Chuck Swindoll, Insight for Living, P.O. Box 4444, Fullerton, California, he gave 80% application, 20% biblical information. Why? Because wisdom comes when we live it out, not when we know it. Are you with me? Now, I, I want to begin to say these words, and you're going to say them with me. Will you please chat them if you're online, but will you write these down? Wisdom that is from above is first pure Oh, thank you for that. Okay, everyone, if you're going to say it, say it. It is pure. It is peaceable. It is gentle. I like this one. Easy to be entreated. Easy. That means when I am talking to Becky and there's a conflict between us, I could be saying the right thing. But if I'm saying it the wrong way, she's not going to yield to that because it's not gentle. Easy to be entreated. You know another way to say that? It's easy on the ears and easy on the heart. Are you with me? Now, let me just say this. When it comes to pure, you know what that means? There's no mixture. Your motives are right. Today, I guess I had alfalfa here, and a couple was praying for me, and the, uh, the wife came, and she said, your hair is sticking up. Let me fix it. And I was so grateful. I said, thank you. That means that you love me. You see, when someone adjusts us, it doesn't mean they're against us if their motives are pure towards us. Are you with me? Are you with me on that? Now, everyone say this, say peaceable. peaceable. Now, I really love that word. And right now, uh, I'm telling you, would I want more than money itself? More than anything, I want to live my life in peace. I, I do not, yeah, conflict's going to come. James never promises a life without conflict. But he does say that there's a wisdom that comes from above that is pure, that is peaceable, that is gentle, easy to be entreated, without partiality. Come on, you're not partial. You're not partial. Well, I was guilty this week. Jack would go, Jude, Spider-Man, Jude, chocolate milk. Lucy would come up, she'd go, juice bottle, and she'd do this. And I have blue eyes. Her dad has blue eyes. Her and Jack have blue eyes. And so I'm holding her, and she goes, frozen. And she looks at me, she goes, you have blue eyes. You have blue, I have blue eyes. I said, can you give me a kiss? She goes, I said, Jack, we're watching Frozen right now. <laughs> he goes, dude, you promised. I said, Jack, that promise is now broken. <laughs> now, that's not a wisdom that's from above. Can I say it right now? God is not a partial God. He, come on, because of Jesus Christ, all can be loved and considered and receive his grace and mercy. Okay, let's say the five words again. Say uh, pure. pure, say peaceable. peaceable. Gentle, uh, willing to yield. Come on, willing to yield without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now, hypocrisy means you don't wear a mask. I'm not talking about COVID. It's a Greek term, and it was actors. You see, back then, one actor could play two characters. So they had have one character was a happy character. 
Then the other character was a sad, mean character. And that's where they get the word hypocrisy. It's one that wears a mask. I can't tell you one of my favorite things about wearing a mask. Someone could be saying something ridiculous. And I, Becky is so, so good. She could play poker in Vegas. I could not. Because she could keep a straight face. Like if someone says something foolish, I'm like, that's dumb. You know, and my eyebrows are moving. The two eyebrows are becoming one flesh. But the beauty about that mask, I could even like scrunch my uh, lower face and just kind of do this. And they don't know. Can I tell you right now, wisdom is not one that play acts before God. If you're hurting, tell God. If you're struggling, tell God. Come on, it would be better to take the mask off because the anointing is not on the masked you. It's on the real you. Now. I want to say the, and we're going to go to the other uh, wisdom that's from beneath. I want us to say the words again. The uh, wisdom that is from above, say it with me. Wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle or easy to be entreated. Uh, then, oh, help me, Lord, help me, Lord. Willing to yield. Say willing to yield. How many of you are willing to yield? Oh, I don't know. That's hard for me. Okay, I want you to write this down. And it is not partial and it's not hypocritical. It's not filled with hypocrisy. This is what the Lord put on my heart this week. And, and let me just say to you, the person that have the potential to have the most conflict with is the person that I'm committed to the most. And why do you think that when conflicts come and they're going to come, that the enemy would want me to reject, I mean, ignore the conflict, and sometimes I do. Sometimes I'll know this person's not happy with me, and I just ignore it. Most of the times, I don't, I confront it. And I could be saying something that's truthful, but the way I'm saying it is not gentle or easy on the ears and easy on the mind. Why? Why is James writing all these verses about this? I'll tell you why. Not only because conflict is wrong, but conflict stops me, Jude, Pastor Jude, from receiving what God has for me. I want to be able to receive all that God has for me. Therefore, I want to be pure. I want to be peaceable. I want to be easy to be entreated without partiality, without hypocrisy. Are you with me? Now, please get this. Three of these five words. Now, where would James get this? He saw Jesus Christ face so much conflict. How about conflict from the scribes and the Pharisees? Conflict from the Jewish people. Conflict from his own brothers and family. Conflict from people that were around him. Conflict of nature. Conflict of demons. Conflict on the cross as he's being crucified. He saw Jesus face conflict. But Jesus Christ never reacted to the conflict. He didn't operate from wisdom that is from above. He operated from wisdom, I mean, uh, beneath, but wisdom that is from above. Now get this. In the Sermon on the Mount, James must have been there. Let's take the first one, pure. Blessed are the pure in what? Heart, for they shall see God. You know what James is saying? That's not an accident he put pure first. When you go through a conflict, guess what? It causes some bad stuff to rise to the surface, but it has the potential to have Jesus Christ rise to the surface. Okay, another one is this. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, they, are called, they will be called the sons of God. You know, one of the major ways, I'm not just a believer, I'm a child of God. I am a child of God. So when I react with wisdom that's from below and I don't make peace, did you get it? Peacemakers. That means you're going to, hey, what is it? You have a box of flour, you have the cake mix, you have the butter, you have the oil or the water. If you don't mix it or make it, you're never going to have a cake. You have to make peace. It says, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the sons of God. Then this next one, it says, blessed are the meek because they will inherit the earth. Now, I want to go back to James chapter 3 verse 13. Will you go back to 13? Will you look at it? with me. I want you to see this. This is amazing. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by good conduct and his work
works done, get this, in the meekness of wisdom. Get this, in the meekness of wisdom. Now, wisdom is just knowledge applied skillfully. Now, you know what meekness is? Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. The Hebrew picture of meekness is a captain is on a war horse. They're in a battle all day. The horse has not rested or been able to drink water. The captain will bring that war, the commander bring that war horse in the middle of a ravine. And that war horse who's strong and powerful will not drink until the captain gives the command to drink. And he will sit there, and that is the last test when a commander would see if the war horse passed the test that they were meek, strength under control. Just because you have the power to react doesn't mean you should react. I want to have my strength under control. And Moses, the greatest man in the Old Testament, he wrote of himself, Moses, the meekest man in all the world. And it had to be true. Is that not funny? Moses. Can you imagine if I was writing a book in the Bible? Pastor Jude, the most humble man in all the city. But you know what? He was strong. Don't think Moses wasn't strong. He killed an Egyptian. He hit a rock. He had a lot of strength. He didn't do it all perfect. And James is bringing into account that if you are strong, you become meek when you have it under control. Are you with me? Say wisdom that is from above. Now let's deal with wisdom that is from beneath. I want to go back to the uh, back to James three. Wisdom that is from beneath. Now get this. I love this. It says, "But if you have bitter envy, please write that down. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking, where in your heart, don't boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not come from above. It is earthly." It is sensual. It is demonic. It has a lot of negative karma. For where there's envy and self-seeking and confusion in every evil thing are there. I want to begin to talk about wisdom that is from beneath. Now watch me. We have a few minutes left. When we begin to speak about a wisdom that is from above and a wisdom that is from beneath, they say where uh, uh, James got those thoughts, that concept was from the books of wisdom, that Solomon, the wisest man on the earth except the one who was greater than Solomon, and that is Jesus Christ. And so wisdom that is from above is Proverbs. And this is how Proverbs starts. Hear me, and we won't go much longer. Proverbs starts this way. Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. And he said, in all you're getting, get wisdom. He says, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord isn't like, oh, I'm scared, daddy. No, fear of the Lord is I have an awesome respect for God. You hear me? When you go to the Grand Canyon, they have that little dilapidated fence. And if you're just leaning over, climbing, you, you are lacking sense at that point. God is powerful. And wisdom begins, that wisdom from above begins with a worship of God, a, a respect of God. More than your pleasures, more than your desires. And by the way, God wants you and I to have ambition. Do not think when you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to have any ambition or have no pleasures. He says selfish ambition. What happens when we yield to Jesus Christ, our ambition gets transformed and God is a God of pleasure. It says at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. But I don't want to live just for pleasure because that is fleeting. Okay. Now watch this and we're going to be in it. Everyone say Proverbs. Ecclesiastes. Say Proverbs. I'm standing on my toes. Say Ecclesiastes. Proverbs is the wisdom that is from above. Ecclesiastes is the wisdom that is from beneath. And Solomon wrote them both. Now get this. This is how Ecclesiastes says. Words from the teacher words from the teacher and then a word that is used about 38 times in that book is meaningless 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 or another way to say it vanity 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 
Here's a guy who had over 1,000 wives and concubines. He had written and read more books. He said reading of books is no end to it. He had studied botany. He had become wealthy. He understood ships and water and armies. And he says meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. You know the meaning of that in Hebrews? It literally means vapor. That life is like a vapor. This morning, the marine layer was in at the beach. I'm up early. The sun comes up, and I'm trying to see if I could see the hills here in beautiful Ventura. Before 7 o'clock came, that marine layer disappeared, and I could see the hills. Can I tell you, blink your eyes twice, and you will not be 20. You will be 61. And life passes so quickly. And what is it if we gain the whole world and we have money and we have pleasure and we had ambition and we got that which we aspired for. But without God and without relationship, it becomes like a smoke or a vapor or a marine layer. It is meaningless. I'm going to invite the band to come up. I want to tell you this. Jack and Lucy, I love anyone who has a five-year-old and uh, almost a three-year-old. That in itself is a full-time job. And they left yesterday about 5 p.m. Praise the Lord. Hail Mary. <laughs> Jude, uh, Spider-Man. Jude, no, I'm talking to you. Put your phone down. You know, and it's like constant. Uh, she's going, uh, I want Coco Melon. I hate Coco Melon. <laughs> if you don't know who that is, you don't have young children. <laughs> and so I, I've never reacted to the grandkids, whether it's Rio Quincy or Lucy and Jack. I've wanted to, but yesterday, they got here Sunday night, and I have not stopped. I want to say, neither did BB. We did not stop. And it's like, man, I need a vacation. And we're going to Hawaii with them in a couple weeks. I thought, oh my God, that is going to be a conflict. <laughs> God, give me wisdom from above. <laughs> Kid you not. I thought, you know what? I'm just going in my office and I'm going to have him knock on my door and I'm just going to breathe. I'm going to put my headphones in kid you not, God gave me an impression. He spoke to my mind and heart through an impression and intuition. He said, before you know it, they will not ask you for a juice bottle or a glass of chocolate milk with ice in the Spider-Man cup with the Spider-Man straw. They will not ask you to turn on Coco Melon, Frozen, or Spider-Man. And they will not ask you to watch it with them. And he says, no, I want to sit where you're sitting. I said, Jack, we're kind of both getting bigger, so it's not as comfortable. No, he goes, no, I want to sit with you. And there will be a day, before you know it, there'll be 20 with friends, and who knows? Maybe they'll have iPhone glasses or something. And it will pass like a vapor. And right in that moment, wisdom from above came. It's like, you know what? These are my babies. And if it's one more time I have to share this chair with him, I'm going to be willing to be uncomfortable. I am going to be willing to sacrifice for them. You know, you're not going to believe this. One, I loved the shutdown. Okay, I know you're going to hate me. For one reason. Okay, let me explain it. I didn't love that people died over a half a million. I don't like the virus or the variant, the Delta variant. But what I loved is I got to be by myself. And I noticed when I'm not around people, I do not have conflict. I mean, yes, there are times you want chocolate, you want vanilla, you want I mean, and you know, it was, it's awesome. A little zoom here, a little zoom there, but peace in the family. Peace in the church. About two years ago, 
as Becky and I were two years into being empty nesters, our adult sons who were married and men, I don't know why they don't argue with her. I don't know why the conflict is with me. I think maybe Becky will just ignore conflict and she'll go work out, Trader Joe's, talk to her friend, walk on the beach, ride the bike. But I don't know. You start poking at me, I'm gonna poke back. And so we got into a conflict. And this happened two years ago. And we are confronting one another. A spear is being thrown at me. It's like they came into my tribe on Weymouth Lane, threw a spear. I went and got my own spear and I threw a spear back. And the spears were flying. And the next day, when we came together, we went to Wood Ranch, come on, where two or three are gathered, there is food. <laughs> Kid you not, true story. Hey, is there anyone you're throwing a spear at? Is there anyone that you're operating on that lore wisdom? It's not pure, it's not peaceful, it's not easy to be entreated, it's not, it is partial, and it is hypocritical. And so get this, I sat there, and I told you, John and Jake, I said, I want you to know something. Listen to me. We have to think in an eternal way. And I did my best as a dad. And I think I was a great dad. But I'm a fallen dad. And I said, Jude and Jake, now you get to have your turn. And one day your children are going to be adult children. I said, but when, please hear me. I'm Indy. This is very important. Online and here. I said, Jude, when we get on the new earth in heaven... I will not always be married to your mother. It says death, only death will separate them. I don't understand this concept, but Becky will be married to Jesus and I will be married to Jesus. I don't know how that will go down. I said, I will not always be a lead pastor. I don't know in heaven, I think I'm gonna be a worshiper and a servant of God. But I said, boys, look at me. There is something I will always be. Even on the new earth, they will say, you see those three? They are a son of that Adam named Jude. And I will always be your dad. And if you think that I am going to react with a demonic, confusing reaction from wisdom that's earthy, which means, you know what the word pagan is? They are of the earth. I was made of the earth, but I'm made in the image of God. And I'm not going to respond like a pagan. I'm going to respond like a child of God, a son of God. I'm going to be a peacemaker. And I'm not joking you. You can ask my wife, you can ask them. Since that point, we have not. Do we have disagreements? Yes, I think we need to be disagreeable. But still in alignment with the wisdom that comes from heaven. Are you with me on that? Now, will you stand? I want to say this. Think of it. Jesus Christ is in the garden. The conflict is so intense. His sweat turns to blood. There are people here, or maybe watching online, the conflict that you're facing keeps you up at night. It is attackatory, and it's assaulting in the nature of who we are. We want to react. I am not. Becky and I both. You kind of come against us. It's our nature. We're going to confront it, really. But God says, no. Jesus said, it said of Jesus like a lamb led to the slaughter. He did not open his mouth. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the conflict. He didn't ignore the conflict. He didn't react to the conflict. He yielded to the cross that you and I can experience wisdom that is from above. Okay? Now, James 4 says, where do fights and wars, where do fights and wars come from? It's not the other person's fault. I know you think it is. It's your fault. It's something wrong in you. Doesn't it come? You have desires within and you want, but you don't ask. And when you do ask, you ask amiss. That means you sin. You know what the sin is? The sin of unbelief. Where your heart and the conflict really ends. Hear me. Conflict begins with you. Didn't begin with Becky, didn't begin with the boys. It began, I was a sinner. 
that I am saved by grace. And when I accepted Jesus Christ, really my war was not against people. My war was against God. But when I yielded to the loving God and he came into the neighborhood, it opened me up where I actually wanted to resolve conflict in my life. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to count to three. Here if today, you need to invite Jesus Christ into your life. Come on. I, it's not just a sermon. I don't want to just kind of barely get across the street. I made it into heaven. I want to live well. I want to live skillfully. I want to live well with my money, my relationships. Come on. You know what matters? Relationships. I'm going to say that again. You know what matters? Relationship. I'm going to say that again. You know what matters? Relationship. That's why the devil attacks us in our relationships. Thank you for that overwhelming response. I, I received that. Now I'm going to count to three. You're saying, I want to open and yield my life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to count to three. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. On one, on three, you're going to raise your hand. You say, well, I don't want to raise my hand. Yup, there's already a battle going on. It's not you and me. It's you versus God and God coming into your life. Two, on three, you're going to raise your hand. I'm yielding my life to Jesus Christ. On three, if that's you, raise your hand. In the back, in the back, in the back, right here, right here, right here, right there, right there, right there, right there, online. Come on. Woo. Stomp, cheer. Online, you can click that link. I want all of us to say this. Will you do this with me? And I, I don't want to manipulate. And this may be uncomfortable. I just want you to hold your hands like this, everybody. God, forgive me. Just, you can say it after me. That's okay. It's a shared talk or shared prayer. Say, God, forgive me. My heart has been at conflict with you. I yield. I yield. Forgive me, come into my life, resolve this conflict, make me a child of God, and I pray, rule in my life with your peace and your splendor. Where there's confusion, bring clarity. Where there's spear throwing, bring submission. Where there's, I have to win, bring worship where there's I have to be right make me righteous and I yield to you Jesus you know right now I want to pray God really we hate the conflict of politics in our nation we hate what's happening between different groups our nation has become so tribal but yet Lord the ones that are closest the ones we know. I pray where these beautiful relationships have become fractured, heal, bring together. Let it be pure, let it be peaceful. Let it be easy to be entreated, which means gentle. Let it be without partiality, without hypocrisy. And I pray that we will sow the very seed of righteousness in mercy. In Jesus' name, God, make us merciful. God, we receive mercy. We want to give mercy in Jesus' name. Forgive someone today. Forgive someone today. Say what Jesus said. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. And I was the same way before Christ. And even after Christ, there's sometimes you just don't know what you're doing because you're deceived and you're confused. But our God is not the author of confusion. He is a God of clarity. And God, I pray our purity, our peaceableness, our easy to be entreated gentleness will turn them. Come on, a gentle answer turns away wrath in Jesus' name.